As you do that, I'm going to nudge this pulpit a little closer only because there's better light the closer this thing gets to that step. I know we have decor there that my wife probably wants you to see, but I need a little more light. So, have you, if you found the book of Matthew chapter 1, okay, as you have, let me ask you this question. Other than the Christ child, other than the baby Jesus, when you think, when you imagine Imagine with me now, when you imagine, when you visualize the manger scene, what characters do you see there? Who do you, who, what, who comes to mind? Who, who, who graces the canvas of your imagination as you consider the manger scene? And which, and which, and now many of you have your, your insert and you know, so you're trying to cheat already by giving me the right answer, but stop doing that and just play along, okay? Okay. Uh, which of these characters is normally celebrated in song and story? Right? Oh, sure, the baby Jesus. And I, but I told you, other than him, who else do we sing about? Oh, we sing about Mary, don't we? Right? We always, people are always wanting to know what Mary knew. Huh. Right? Oh my God. <laughs> right? I mean, there, they, there's the songs about everything. There's a song about stars and do you hear things? Right? And lambs and stuff. And Herod's got an, a, an honorable mention a couple of times. Said to the king, to the people everywhere. Which he didn't really say. He was like, I'm going to do something really bad. But that's a whole nother thing. Think about, think about all the people that get the song. Right? Shepherds, they get a song. Angels, they get a song. Magi, they get a song. We three kings have come a long way, but there are more than three of us. Dad will explain that later. Pay attention. Following yonder, the star. Everything. And you know what else? Even that little rascal with a snare drum somehow found his way into a song. And he wasn't even there. But I love that song. pa pum pum You know who didn't get a song? Joseph. Yeah, that's right. I, <laughs> well, it's also like printed everywhere. Uh, Joseph. Joseph. Who, who is that guy? Who is that kind-faced gentleman hovering over Mary at the major scene? He's a guy who's not really following the all-is-calm motif. He keeps doing things to make sure that Mary is comfortable and he's checking to see if the baby is okay. And he really, really gave the stare down and the third degree and the once over to those grimy shepherds before he let them see the baby. Who's that guy? That's Joseph. He didn't get a song. But don't you dare underestimate him. He's important. Matthew wrote more about Joseph than he did Mary. I think God thought Joseph was important. And whether that babe in a manger knew it or not, even Jesus needed a Joseph. As we walk through the Gospel of Matthew, we remember that this is most certainly about Jesus the King. Would you say Jesus the King? Jesus. This is all about Jesus. And, and uh, we will listen in the text for what we can learn about Jesus. We will listen in the text for how you and I can and should live as followers of Jesus Christ, as participants in the kingdom of God, mostly this will happen as we listen to and observe the life of Jesus. But it will also happen, we can learn a great deal from the example of those who interacted with Jesus. We can learn a great deal about, uh, uh, from how people approached him and how he responded to people. And today, we will learn a great deal from someone who cared for Jesus. In your Bibles, the book of Matthew, chapter 1, and verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows When his mother Mary had been betrothed. 
to Joseph. Time out. Reminding us what betrothed means. That in that day, betrothed was as serious a covenant as already married. It was stronger than engaged, but they hadn't come together as man and wife yet. But there was, the covenant was sealed. They were, they were lawfully together. And we remember that in the book of Revelation, this rem reminded that that is, that is the picture of you and I right now. We are in covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ, but he still is yet to come for us. The midnight cry has not gone out. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. But he's coming. He, that, sooner or later, that cry will come. But that cry had not come yet. They were betrothed. They were in covenant. They were, in, they were lawfully man and wife, but just not intimately man and wife. They were betrothed. This was serious. So when his mother Mary, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, and Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Everybody say, in a dream, because we're going to hear that more. In a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David. Ooh, Matthew's audience said, ooh, 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 there it is again, son of David. The Joseph, son of David. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Verse 24, and Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. And he took Mary as his wife, but he kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. Joseph got some pretty unexpected news on the way home from the carpentry shop. Mary, his betrothed, was pregnant. Before they came together, she was found to be pregnant. And her testimony, her testimony was that this happened by the Holy Spirit. His betrothed, his young bride-to-be was pregnant. And her story is, God did it. Right. <laughs> now, this of course, initially... Is not believable. Yet it, it had every appearance of sin and betrayal. Golly, nobody likes to use that phrase when we're talking about Mary betrayal, because it almost sounds like Hail Mary, full of grace, not supposed to be the betrayer. But but un put yourself right in the I know in hindsight we're thinking, but of course it was God. Put yourself right there. For Joseph, this had every appearance of sin and betrayal, and it would have felt heartbreaking, and it would have been jealousy-inducing. When Joseph heard that Mary was pregnant, somebody was going to get punched. More than once, and they may not even see it coming. But here's where we learn something first about this unsung tradesman. Verse 19 said, he was righteous. Everybody say righteous. righteous. He was righteous. And then it says, he did not want to expose Mary to public disgrace. So he decided to put her away secretly. See, Justice here 
justice would have allowed or even required for Joseph to give her, first of all, a certificate of divorce. Stating the reason for that divorce. And then Mary would have been publicly scorned and then probably, possibly, publicly stoned. If they would have followed the letter of the law, that, 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 that kind of infidelity had the death penalty. But Joseph, who, who, who by all appearances was the one sinned against, immediately chose not to seek revenge. God did not have to intervene and stop Joseph from condemning Mary. Not yet. It just says immediately Joseph sought to put her away quietly. Meaning there was, that was the third option. The first option would have been divorce, public. The second option would have been to just follow through with this thing publicly, but then invite shame and scorn on himself and on her to, to walk into big shame. And then the, the third option was then was a unique one. What he sought to do was put her away quietly. The, the best equivalent I could give you would be to find a convent for her and tuck her away there. No one would have found her. She wouldn't have had a social security number. There was no Twitter account. She, so there was no social media. It was much easier just to, put, just to hide her. Not, not to hide his own shame, but to protect her. Nobody even had to intervene. His first thought was, I'm going, I'm going to protect her. But then, as even as he was considering this merciful option... In all of those things, Joseph chose mercy. Would you say it out loud with me? Joseph chose mercy. And we see that in the text, mercy persuaded judgment and gave birth to redemption. Now, as he's considering this, an angel appears to Joseph in a dream to encourage Joseph to stay on course that all was just as Mary had said, and that this child was from the Holy Spirit. That's important for the reader to hear, that this child is a, is a result of, that, that Christ himself is an expression of the Spirit of God. We're going to talk more about that next week. But that he was born by the Spirit. But what we see as we step back is that God showed Joseph who he was going to care for. When we see people, even those closest to us, through the lens of heaven, we realize that our relationship with them is not coincidence, it is calling. God helps Joseph through the lens of heaven, see people the way God sees them. See the people closest to you through the lens of heaven and you, and you will, you see this is, this is who this person is and you understand, hey, this is not a coincidence. This is not just happenstance. This is a calling. Joseph accepted the challenge in verses 24 and 25. He accepts Mary as his wife. He, he embraces her, takes ownership of her life and this unborn child, and yet does not come together with her as husband and wife yet to honor her and to honor the promise of God. He continues to, to, he, he, he continues to act righteously. And in his obedience, his obedience to the word of God, and all he's doing, Joseph's devotion to God determines his care for those close to him. Joseph's de devotion to God determines his care for those closest to him. And in this simple obedience of accepting Mary, but honoring her until, and, and, and keeping her a virgin even until after the Christ child is born, even that obedience fulfills ancient prophecy so that Jesus can be called Emmanuel. See, your obedience just to God, even in just caring for those around you, makes you instrumental in the actions of the kingdom of God. The kingdom flows through people who are just obeying God. 
The kingdom is established. The kingdom, this, we get this, this, mil, this militant, mighty, colorful flag flowing. Burm, 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 burm. How does the kingdom of God advance? Well, it advances in power and might. It also advances as people just quietly, daily, diligently, faithfully obey God. And today, as they do all that, caring for those closest to them. The kingdom as we care. Joseph accepted the challenge. He knew what was coming. He knew what could be said about him, about his young betrothed bride, and about this mysterious child in her womb. But Joseph was no coward. He accepted his commission from heaven to care for this family. God trusted Joseph God trusted Joseph with the salvation of the planet. God trusted Joseph with the Savior of the world. Joseph's devotion to God determined his care for those closest to him. So should yours. Your devotion to God should determine your care for those close to you. And as we have seen with Joseph, the first step is seeing people through the lens of heaven. Let God show you how he sees them. That's pretty good so far, isn't it? But there's more. We're going to kind of break the Christmas rules. We're not supposed to jump ahead in the Christmas story until Christmas morning. Yeah, I know. It's, it's part of church theology. It's in Ezekiel 47.10. But, yeah, I know it's only December 9th, but jump forward. Fast forward. We'll, get, we'll come back to the manger scene. Don't worry. Go, we're past the manger scene. Two years later, we three kings of Orient are, have come. The Magi have come, talked to Herod. All that happened. Bad stuff, good stuff. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Done. Magi, gone. We've been to Bethlehem. It's been at least two full years. The Magi have gone. Pick it up. Here we go. Verse 13. Now when they, the Magi, when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get up, take the child and his mother. God speaks to Joseph in his dreams about how to care for those close to him. Joseph's dreams are God-saturated, God-called, God-directed, and they're about those that God has assigned Joseph to care for. Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the Lord, through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. That is in Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1. So once again, fast forward, Joseph's care, his devotion to God that determined his care for those close to him, his obedience to God is once again fulfilling prophecy. The kingdom of God continues to advance. The promises of God are proven true. The word of the Lord is brought to bear because somebody obeyed God. Somebody, and not, and not again, not in grandiose ways, but in faithful caring for those close to them. Even after Bethlehem, even after the Magi, even after all of that, Joseph continued to obey God. An angel appears to Joseph and says, move to Egypt. Now you and I can read this in hindsight and we're not too affected. Right? Again, we read it and we read it. We know the story and we, oh, well, gee, I mean, the angel told him to go to Egypt. Clearly, going to go to Egypt. Again, slow down. Put yourself right in the story. You've got, you've got, a, you've got a, 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 a husband and a wife and a young child and, and they're, 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 living, they're living in the land of Israel, probably st still near the area of Bethlehem. They're two years into this. Anybody remember two years into raising the kiddo? Anybody? But I saw a watcher, you remember that? 
Everything's peaceful and calm and quiet and easy, isn't it? Life is ironed out, easy peasy, everything's on schedule. You're on easy street, am I right? High five. No, you are not. You're trying to, you're doing all kinds of things. You're trying to, this Joseph's trying to, to, to uh, uh, housing and care and food and, and relationships and advancing his career. He's got to get things going. There's expectations on him from the Jewish community to make something of himself to make sure that, that he has enough to care for his family. He's, he's supposed to be saving money for grandkids by now. You think it's tough being an American, try being a Jew. There's some pressure, pressure to earn and to take care of and to be stable and to be, and to be, and, to, and, the, and, the, and the community looking at Joseph thinking, hmm, is he honorable? Meanwhile, everybody's staring. Is that really his boy? Yeah. Think of all the pressure, all the things, all the expectation. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, he says, God said I have to go to Egypt. <laughs> sure he did. Sure he did. What kind of nutso idea would that be? Pick up your kids and flee in the middle of the night, go to Egypt. And it wasn't like, it, 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 it'd be nuts if Brian said to me, oh, you know what? I'm moving to Idaho. I'd be like, what? Listen, bro, marijuana might be legal, but it's not good for you. <laughs> Put it down. <laughs> for the record, Officer Saltwasser is not using marijuana. Um, <laughs> Uh, but this wasn't even like going to Idaho and on, on, on some interstate. This would have been a dangerous trip. And he flees the scene. He does something absolutely crazy. He, he, he faces risk and ridicule. Not to mention the fact, what about Joseph's career? I mean, he's, he's, what, about his, what about his dreams and his plans? His career path? God keeps interrupting Joseph's dreams. Ever since the Holy Spirit showed up, Joseph's dreams have not been about him, but about how he is to care for others. So Joseph obeys God's word regarding how to care for his family. Read that story again. The angel said, you need to, this, is where you need, this is what you need to do. This is where you need to go. There's, this is the threat against your family. God will not only show you who you're caring for, God will show you how to care for them. God cares even more than you do. He'll show you how. Come on, somebody say, he'll show us how. This is, the, this is the example Joseph gives us. Joseph leans into heaven. Heaven shows him, gives him the lens to see through heaven's eyes. This is who you're caring for. And then heaven says, as you pay attention, he'll show you how. He'll show you where to go, what to do, what to avoid, what threats. And Joseph's obedience, once again, fulfills prophecy. But then there's more. They hang out in Egypt for a while. Perhaps Joseph's got himself a good job. He's moved from Tucson to central Washington, back down to the Coop. Sorry, a little personal stuff there. He's been moving around there. Finally got himself settled. Bought this house that nobody wants. Builds it perfectly, right, Brother Wally? Anyway, so he, he's in, now he's in Egypt. And maybe he's enjoying a few more palm trees than there was there in, uh, in uh, you know, Israel. It's a, it's a, little, more, a little too sandy, but whatever. <laughs> They've been there for a couple of years. Right? Jesus is at least four, maybe five. Maybe, you know, he's, he's into preschool or beyond. Jesus is talking. As a matter of fact, being a good Jew, Jesus is already learning to memorize the book of Leviticus. In Egypt. That was the first book they started learning and memorizing. Pick it up at verse 19. But when Herod died, behold, are you kidding me? An angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. 
So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he had heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Then, after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. He shall be called a Nazarene. And Matthew hasn't even told us yet that it also fulfills Isaiah chapter 9. That in Galilee of the Gentiles, a light shall dawn upon those who sit in darkness. That every time Joseph listens and obeys God. And every time that Joseph's devotion to God determines the care for those closest to him. The kingdom of God is advancing. Joseph was honoring God and obeying God's how for the who that God had placed in his life. I said a moment ago that by this time, by the time they left Egypt, Jesus would have been walking and talking. And, and anybody ever met a preschooler that had their own opinion? Anybody? <laughs> anybody? <laughs> anybody? <laughs> Whew, anybody but three or four? <laughs> right? If this would have been a myth, you know how the the, the, the higher criticism and the deconstructionists like to say that the Bible stories are myth. If this would have been a myth, a Greek myth, then the story would have read that uh, probably right from, the, right from the manger scene, the Christ child would have stood up in a holy gown, spoken with, a, with an Elizabethan accent, and given instructions to the parent as to where they should go. That would sound more Zeus's or, you know, apollo -y or something. Pa pantheon -y, Okay. <laughs> It would have been early. The, the legends and myths would read like that. But in this story, in this story, Joseph doesn't even ask the precious Christ child his opinion. Right. <laughs> Joseph's de devotion to God determined his care for those closest to him, but that didn't mean coddling. Jesus might have been the savior of the world, but Joseph was the head of the household. Yeah, yeah. We're moving. Why? God said. <laughs> Joseph is a great example that no matter how precious our wee ones are, to care for them means that we lead them. Joseph's devotion to God determines his care for those closest to him and Matthew calls him righteous. Righteous. We don't know how long Joseph was with Jesus. We don't hear much more about Joseph after Jesus turns 12. Remember at 12, Jesus, they, Jesus gets, stays behind in church and hangs out and is engaging in, in rabbinical Q&A and being really cool and amazing. And everybody in church thinks he's great. Joseph is not thrilled. <laughs> right? Joseph is like, don't tell me your father's business. I know that guy. <laughs> 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 We've talked before you got here. <laughs> Somewhere it seemed that Joseph had passed away before Jesus began his public ministry. But his contribution to Jesus' life, I suspect, was very significant. I want you to just Put on your sanctified imagination with me and walk through this. Having considered Joseph's exceptional character and conduct, consider this. Where did Jesus first learn about mercy and kindness and loyalty and trust? Who was the first person that Jesus saw seeking God and obeying him. Men pray. 
Men obey God. Men put God first. Your devotion to God should determine your care for those close to you. You know, I can't help but think that Jesus was still honoring Joseph's example when even at the cross, as he is bearing the weight of the world, the sin of the world upon himself, he paused to ensure that someone would remain to care for Mary. There he is on the cross, bleeding and in excruciating agony, but he pauses and looks down at John, his beloved friend, and says, Behold your mother, and mother, behold your son. Because I, 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 something, something still in his core knew that that's what dad would have wanted. That's, how, that's what dad modeled. Where, where else would Jesus' little brother James, who would later write, where else would he learn that mercy triumphs over judgment? Why do you think Jesus did exactly what his mother wanted, even if it wasn't on his schedule in John chapter 2? They're out of wine. Well, it's not my time. <laughs> we like to say it was because Mary was an intense Jewish mama, but I think, I think there was another influence at work. How, how was it, how was it that Jesus knew so certainly that fathers knew how to give good gifts to their children. I think it was because Jesus had a Joseph. Jesus was divine. Jesus studied the scriptures probably far more than we know. But I believe he still learned plenty from Joseph, and I think we can too. Joseph, as an example to us, let me start with, with parents and perhaps particularly with dads, but anybody that kind of fits that parental thing, your devotion to God should determine your care for those closest to you. Your dreams should be Christ-centered. Your life and leadership should be about honoring God. Serving Christ and stewarding the responsibility you have for those God has entrusted to you. Ask God to show you who they are. Some of that, that may take some diligence sometimes to keep seeing people through the lens of heaven. Then seek God for how to care for them. What's that mean? Listen to God's word. Put his word first in your home. God should be a higher priority than your vocation or your recreation. Model devotion to God. Model mercy. Model righteousness. Joseph was called righteous because his devotion to God determined how he cared for those close to him. And I believe heaven is looking for the same from us. How we treat, remember the Lord kept saying, take the child and his mother. Heaven is looking for our devotion to God to determine our care for our spouses, for our children. See, Joseph really demolishes it right away in the kingdom as we see the kingdom of God beginning. We see that the kingdom of God happen, happens initially, not only, but initially the kingdom of God begins at home. And Joseph in particular shows us that 
that there is no such thing as compartmentalization in the kingdom of God. There's no compartmentalization of our spiritual life. Joseph, we don't see Joseph modeling coming to church with our best or whatever, either our best or our most comfortable attire and our churchy face and our praise God and our hallelujah is just in the right spot. And our, how you doing, brother? Amen, amen. You know, we master all that stuff and then go home and are crass or, 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 or brash or vulgar or vain or distant or just mean. Joseph destroys the possibility of that myth immediately. There is no compartmentalization of your spirituality. That devotion to God means, determines my care for those around me. For my wife, for my kids, your spouse. What about adult children and grandchildren? Yeah, even after the manger scene, you and I are still a steward for those who are close to us. We, are, we still walk in responsibility. There, there will come a day. There will come a day. There will come a day, a hundred years from now, when my parents will retire from this earth. A hundred years or more. And at that point, they're off the hook. But not until. <laughs> no, they don't got to buy my lunch money. Although, if I'm honest, if I'm going somewhere, my dad will still give me five or ten bucks, like for the plane or more. Hey, here's a little walking around money, son. Dad, I'm 48. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> You're going to skip off. <laughs> Have a good one, champ. <laughs> <laughs> children, grandchildren, adult, if you're, it, it might be after the manger scene, it might be after the magi, but you're still a steward. You still serve and care and encourage and protect them. You still bless your adult children. I've told you before, I know, and now I'm just setting myself up. But it's not Sunday till my dad says, good job, son. If he's gone, I'm depressed. I'm not lying. <laughs> My mom had a whistle. A whistle, yeah? In the, and we live in a neighborhood, and when I, when I was supposed to come home, she blow that whistle. Bleep! Uh, and you know what she blow it in the summertime on a Sunday? Like at 4.30. You know why? Because church was at six. Newman. <laughs> I can remember the times in the back, laying in the back of the cars, thinking to myself, I don't want to go to church on Sunday night. I want to go get dirty. And the dirt and the grass and things and things. <laughs> but my parents prioritized the kingdom. There are two sounds. Yeah, I'm taking a couple more minutes this time. It's almost right. There are two sounds that I remember as a child growing up in my house. Two sounds. Two, two clear sounds that I remember. One of them is Perry Mason. Oh, it's noon. It must be noon. The other, the other is my mom's record player and hearing songs like His Eye is on the Sparrow and hearing my mom fervently praying, not too loudly, but, but not under her breath, in the dining room, seeking God. I used to think when I was really little that life was God, the Davenports, and everybody else. I didn't even know if anybody else knew who God was, but I knew we did. I'll just say it, because I was raised by Joseph. Joseph. 
But you know, Joseph is a model for everyone in the room, not just padres and parents. He's a model for all of us. Because one of the first things that Joseph tells us is this, that when it comes to the kingdom of God, it's not about me. It's about Christ. And it's about his kingdom. And for all of us, serving Christ means caring for those within our reach. Seeing people as God sees them and then responding to them, caring for them with the strength and the wisdom that God provides. Again, I'm, I come back. I don't, this isn't about me. I wouldn't use myself as an example other than to be silly or tell self-deprecating stories. But if there's, if there's somebody else in my life that I would think of that's not, my, that's not a parent, but, a, but, a, but there's a person in my life who I, who I would have the affection and the courage to refer to as a father and a friend and a pastor, it's Phil Taylor, a pastor in Tulsa, Oklahoma. When I was in my 20s, Lori and I had, uh, were asked to take over a church that was, that was not doing well. And uh, there was a lot of things that happened and, 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 at a big, and there was a big banking error and all kinds of nonsense. It wasn't our fault. Anyway, what happened was we stepped in just in time to try to land a crashing plane. I was 26 years old and my first senior pastorate was to close a church. Very, very prestigious resume. So we were, uh, we thought we could do it too, but we, I thought I could just pull it off with, with, with prayer and charisma and, uh, and uh, it, we had to close the thing. And, and uh, so we closed it and uh, we, one Sunday morning, just not long after that, we were, we found ourselves, we, we, we didn't have a church that we worked at and didn't have a church to go to. And I, we looked at the phone book. I was literally looking in the phone book one Sunday morning, where to go to church. And then I thought, this is it. Maybe for you, that's not a big deal. It's fine. But me, I consider myself, I'm the son of Jim Davenport, and I'm looking in a phone book for where to go to church? This is horrible. I was depressed. So I said, fine, we're just going to go. We went to the closest church. I knew where it was. There was an AG church not far from us. We got there. We showed up late. We sat about right where, right where Jay's sitting in the church. I sat there. We were in church. I don't remember anything about the day, but we were there, and, on the, we were, and then church was over, and we were going to leave. Me and my young bride, she's, I'm 26, so she's 22 Maybe. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, we're leaving and we're going to go out the doors of the church and we're going to go home. And I said to her, da, 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 I should at least go say hi to the guy. So I turn around and I come back and he's at the stairs at the church there where they're having prayer and he's, all that's wrapping up and he's sitting there chillaxing. And, and I thought, well, I'll go say hello. So I go say hello to the guy. And of course, like any good preacher, I drop as many, as many names as I can. I know this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, you know, trying to, trying to connect, right? And, uh, and so he's like, hey, nice to meet you. Yeah, I know them, you know, peace. And so I turn around and I walk, and I walk out the, go to walk out the doors of, the, of, the, of their auditorium there. And I remember I hit the door, we got the, the chunk, the door that goes chunk to open it like that, you know, the, the push bar. I remember the sound, chunk. And just as soon as I hit that door, from the, all the way from the other side of the, of the, of the sanctuary, I hear him say, Hey, you want a cheeseburger? Now, first of all, that's a ridiculous question. <laughs> because, of course, I want a cheeseburger. But it's also a ridiculous question. This man had a, had a thriving church, a young family. He was the presbyter of northeastern Oklahoma, which means he was supervising 72 other churches. And I'm a 26-year-old kid who just closed a church. I've got nothing for him. Nothing. There is nothing that I have to offer him. But somehow, he paused long enough to look through the lens of heaven. And he took us out. We go, we don't, when we go back to Tulsa, we do not ever miss going to the same burger place. We always go to Goldie's. He says, I'll pick you up. We're going to Goldie's. That's right. For the last 20 years plus, 
Phil Taylor has been a father and a friend and a pastor to me. I, 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 to this day, I have nothing to offer him but my affection. To this day. He, he, they, the, he continued to take me out for lunch. He filled our house with groceries on Thanksgiving. Then he had us over to his house on Thanksgiving. And time, every time I've, I've passed through the area, he, has a, he literally said to me on the phone last week, he said, I'll tell you what, we'll just put your name on the downstairs bedroom door. Our devotion to God should determine how we care for those closest to us. All we need to do is see people through the lens of heaven and ask God to give us the strength and the wisdom to care for them. And if we do, we can be instrumental in advancing the kingdom of God. And somebody, somewhere will say, righteous. Amen. Let's stand together as we close today.